Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Implications of the Family First Act for Juvenile Justice Advocates. My name is Rob Gein. I'm the Director of Policy Reform and Advocacy at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and we're thrilled that you've joined us today. We're gonna to start with the next slide. So today you'll be hearing from myself, Tim Decker, who's a senior fellow at the Casey Foundation. And for those of you who don't know Tim, also a former juvenile justice director in the great state of Missouri. Uh, we also have Peter Watson, the senior director of the technical assistance unit at Casey Family Programs, and we're thrilled to have them. Going to the next slide now, our agenda today, you're gonna to get a quick overview of the Family First Act, which we refer to as Family First, uh, the implications for the juvenile justice system, update on state implementation, and then how you can get involved in implementation. I will note that you will have an opportunity to submit questions in the coming days. We will compile those questions and try to answer them to the best of our ability. Moving on. So I'm gonna start uh, with a, a brief overview of the Family First Act. Next. So all of you have joined this call, listening to it. So apparently you already care about the Family First Act, but let me tell you why you've made a really good decision to listen to this webinar. Um, the Family First Act is a very complex bill with potentially significant implications for the juvenile justice system. Obviously, there may be an impact on duly involved youth, youth involved in both child welfare and juvenile justice, but youth who have absolutely no child welfare involvement may also be impacted. There is a possibility that there could be both positive impacts on the juvenile justice system and some unintended consequences. So the law provides for additional services and resources that may support youth involved in the juvenile justice system. It also pre presents the potential risk for youth involved with or at risk of becoming involved with the juvenile justice system. The act does explicitly mention juvenile justice in the, in the law. It's gonna be critical that juvenile justice stakeholders like yourselves are involved in the planning of implementation and that may go a long way to determining whether we see as many of the positives as we hope and we avoid some of the unintended consequences. Moving on to the next slide. So the, after many years of discussion, the Family First Act was passed and signed into law on February 9th of 2018. It was a bipartisan bill, and it's the most significant piece of child welfare related legislation in decades. It's, it's significant because of the resources it provides and the emphasis on keeping children in families, recognizing that that is the best place for children to thrive. There are significant changes to what the federal government will reimburse. Fiscal incentives to, to hopefully push states to do what we know is in the best interest of children. I should also note that there's a significant increase in the investment of resources. Between the Family First Act and the subsequent Family First Transition Act, there's been a, an additional $1 billion of federal investment. Moving on. There are three primary objectives of the Family First. I, I think of this as a stool with three legs. And for those of you who have heard a little bit of Family First, my guess is you've heard a lot about the first two legs, maybe a little less of, uh, about the third. So the first leg is how do we prevent children and youth from entering foster care in the United States? and the ability to fund services to do so. The second is ensuring that if a child does have to come into the foster care system, that children are placed in families where we know that they will succeed. The third is for those young people who do need residential care, whose therapeutic needs are at a level that they cannot be served in a family, we wanna make sure that that intervention is high quality and enables them to achieve what residential treatment is meant to do, allow them to succeed down the road in a family setting. So moving on, we're gonna start with prevention. So prior to Family First, it's important to recognize that federal dollars to prevent entry into foster care were severely limited. The prevention services that 
states may seek reimbursement for include substance abuse, mental health services, and in-home parenting support. All of those services must, however, meet a certain level of evidence base, and there is a, a, an approval process for the federal government to determine which services states can be reimbursed for. So when we're thinking about this, we need to understand who are we talking about? How does, how does a child be, become eligible and their family potentially become eligible for services? So not to get too technical, but there is a term referred to as candidacy. A child must be determined a candidate for foster care, meaning that they're at risk of coming into foster care. States get to determine that definition of candidacy with the federal government providing uh, approval of that. In addition to those young children who are at risk of coming into care, youth who are parenting who are already in foster care are eligible, and then understand that children who have been reunified or adopted may be at risk of coming back into foster care, so they're also eligible. Youth who are arrested, we believe should be considered an eligible population as they are at risk of coming into foster care. So that's how you determine whether a case is eligible, but who receives services is broader. The child may receive services, the caregiver, the parent, or the kinship caregiver also may receive services. Now, how is this funded? The federal government is providing an open-ended entitlement for prevention services, which means the more a state spends, the more it can receive from the federal government. There's a 50% match for, for every uh, reimbursement uh, initially, and then that will go up over time to a state's Medicaid matching rate, or FMAP rate, which in many states is much higher than 50% as high as almost 80% in a few states. Children or caregivers are eligible to receive services for up to 12 months with the federal Family First funds. Obviously, states could continue providing services beyond the 12 months with their own resources or with other federal dollars. In addition, a child can be determined at risk of coming into care or a candidate to, for foster care more than once. So they could receive 12 months of services there could be a break, and then they could be eligible to receive another 12 months of services. If this seems all too complicated, there are state plan requirements. States will be submitting a plan to the federal government, which will then approve the plan with all of these details. So now let's moving on to family foster care. Upon implementation of Family First, the feds will now only reimburse states for the cost of a child if they're in one of four settings. The first is a family foster care placement, relative or non-relative. Second, a specialized setting for pregnant and parenting youth. Third, a specialized setting for those who have been sexually trafficked. And before I go to the fourth, I want to note that the specialized settings for pregnant and parenting and sex trafficked youth are eligible but that does not mean that a child who is pregnant or parenting who are sex trafficked necessarily needs to be in a non-family setting. Those children, those youth should still be considered for family care whenever that is effective and appropriate. Fourth, we have a new term of art in child welfare and that is QRTP or the Qualified Residential Treatment Program or Provider. That is the fourth eligible um, uh, setting, and we're going to get into some more details on what that means on the next slide. Um, I will make one more comment about family foster care before moving on, and that is that the federal government has created a strict definition of what a family can consist of as far as the number of uh, children who can be in that home. So that's something to pay attention to as well. Um, if a QRTP is determined uh, to be a place for a child, there has to be an assessment completed by an independent assessor that demonstrates that that level of care is needed. And note that a lack of available foster homes is not an acceptable reason for suggesting that a child be placed in a, a qualified residential treatment program. Okay, moving on. What is a qualified residential treatment program? First, it must be trauma-informed. Second, um, and related to this is that places that are not therapeutic and group settings will not be eligible for federal reimbursement. 
So a group home that isn't therapeutic or doesn't meet the, the rest of the standards that I'm about to uh, call out for qualified residential treatment programs will not be eligible for federal re reimbursement. States may continue to fund those programs with their own money. So a QRTP must have nursing staff on call and available 24 hours a day. They must be accredited by one of a number of bodies or a state can suggest another accreditation standard. There must be an ongoing assessment process while a child is in qualified residential treatment programs and the courts have a role in making sure that that is going on. Um, families need to be an integral part of the treatment process and there must be post-discharge services and planning. Finally, the court doesn't just approve the ongoing assessment, they must approve the placement in the first place. You will hear sometimes that these are much higher standards than we have placed on residential settings in the past. I would suggest that these are at, 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 at least the minimal standards that we would want for any child, including our own. And so we would hope that every residential program would meet these standards. Okay, moving on. There are some other provisions that I will mention briefly, and uh, if you want more information, I'm sure we'll get to it in question and answers. So uh, the federal funds that are provided in Family First also provide resources for what are commonly referred to as mommy and me programs. These are substance abuse treatment programs that allow a mother and a child to receive treatment together. So a child can remain with their parent, with their mother while in treatment. It creates funds for kinship navigator programs, programs to design to link kinship caregivers, whether they're involved in the child welfare system or not, with needed services to help allow a kinship caregiver to meet the needs of children placed in their homes. There is a requirement that states assure that no policies will be enacted that increase the number of youth in the juvenile justice system and the act specifically calls for the general accounting office to evaluate the effects of Family First on the juvenile justice system. Moving on, I'm gonna offer some sort of general thoughts about Family First before we move on. Um, the first is we often refer to Family First as transformative. It's transformative not only because of the resources, but because of the value that we are now placing on keeping children and families and aligning federal investments to achieve that goal. But it can't simply be about meeting federal requirements. We need to ensure that communities identify what their greatest needs are and then figure out how Family First can support those needs. This cannot be about just maximizing federal resources. I'll also note that this is a work in progress. My guess is it will probably take 20 years to implement Families First full vision and there's going to be a number of changes with the law and the guidance over this period of time. In fact, we've already seen changes. I mentioned the Family First Transition Act, which changed uh, the, the evidence-based requirements and provided $500 million of new money to help states prepare for Family First. I should also note, and I know Peter will be getting into this, the implementation schedule of Family First. States, uh, a, a, a number of states have already begun to implement Family First. Several others have submitted plans. Every state has until 2021 to submit a plan and begin to implement Family First. Now we've mentioned the prevention standards and the QRTP restrictions. Those things go hand in hand. So if a state opts in or starts to try to implement Family First and wants to draw down prevention funds, they have to live under the new restrictions on the qualified residential treatment programs. So I'm gonna stop there. Let me introduce you to Tim Decker, who's the senior fellow at Casey, the Casey Foundation. He's gonna be talking about the implications for juvenile justice. Tim? Thank you, Rob, and an excellent summary of the Family First Act. I, let's go to the next slide. I don't know about all of you. I. As a former juvenile justice director for seven years and a child welfare director for almost five, I had different hats on as I was listening to what Rob was talking about and had the honor to be part of the initial phases of Family First implementation in Missouri and begin to think about how we might 
um, actually um, approach it from a full system perspective in our state. Um, as I listened through my juvenile justice leader lens, um, I was listening and hearing from Rob key words and phrases and concepts um, and trans system transformation strategies that were, should be very familiar and are very familiar to us in, in juvenile justice. Um, I'd like you to think for just a minute, just pause for a minute and think about that um, for yourself and for your system and other systems that you're familiar with. What is it that you heard from Rob that sounded like an opportunity? What is it that you heard from Rob that sounded familiar where not only might the juvenile justice system benefit, but might also bring something to the table? I know for from my perspective, I couldn't help reflecting on uh, the movie Jerry Maguire and the scene near the end where you have the famous line, you had me at hello. Um, Rob, in essence, had me when he said, may support youth involved in juvenile justice or at risk of juvenile justice. Because that opens the door for funding for secondary prevention services for youth who may be included in the definition of candidates for foster care, which very well could include foster youth who may be at risk of entering the juvenile justice system, could certainly involve community youth who we're working with through the juvenile justice system where we're trying to prevent involvement in any system. The opportunity to take a whole system approach to preventing youth from coming into care in either system or spending much time in either system is profound. There will only come if we can increase the level of collaboration and work on creating a true continuum of care between the courts, the juvenile justice system, and the child welfare system. When we began this implementation in Missouri, um, we started with thinking about what type of system do we really believe that we need to have. It's hard in an environment where people are trying to comply with the law to do that, but often the best approach is to say, what type of system do we want and what type of system, how do we want to work across systems to best serve all of our young people? And then how could family first, the things you heard from Rob, actually advance that cause? Tremendous opportunity. One of the most profound is, quite frankly, the opportunity to expand access to community-based services for older youth regardless of the system that they're at risk of becoming involved with. Next. There's also some risk with anything that's valuable comes risks. Uh, as we begin to think about transforming our system, if we're not philosophically grounded, well-grounded in um, some of the underlying kind of philosophy and values of the Family First Act and of many of the system transformation efforts in juvenile justice, we could easily drift off course. One thing that could happen is it could widen the net of child welfare and increase the number of youth involved in multiple systems. Uh, because of some of the um, provisions that um, children and youth and families who are served through prevention services have to have a prevention plan, you are talking potentially about some level of system involvement and, and attention to the system that would come with um, families young people and children being involved in prevention services. So there's always that risk that we faced in juvenile justice of widening the net as we become more involved in any aspect of the system. The, the law also expands the role of the court systems in determining appropriate placements for youth. So not only in the QRTP requirements do young people need to be assessed by a third party to determine the appropriateness for residential care, but there's also the requirement for court approval of those placements um, within the first 60 days. So you are going to have more court involvement in placements, which can be certainly a strength in terms of additional oversight, additional checks and balances. It can also um, bring direction and perhaps a loss of control for either system in some of those decisions. The other impact that many have been worried about early on is how it might affect the viability of smaller residential treatment centers um, based on the QRTP requirements. There are certain requirements around accreditation and staffing and the things that, um, that Rob talked about, um, certainly um, concepts and approaches such as trauma-informed care or things we're very familiar with, but there's also some really significant core requirements that might be difficult for smaller residential treatment centers to meet. Because of that, you could lose some of your capacity in your state. 
um, which could be a significant challenge. It could also be a blessing in terms of um, causing our system to think more and more about how we keep children in families. There's also a provision that states need to ensure that this does not lead to increases in youth, as Rob stated, entering the juvenile justice system and youth incarceration. Uh, how states go about doing that through data, through cross-system accountability, um, through the checks and balances that they put in place is something that um, needs to be addressed as part of the planning process. Um, obviously, uh, that was one of my first concerns through the lens of a juvenile justice director about thinking about if it's more, and this is a very simplistic view, if it's more difficult to place children and keep children in residential care on the child welfare side, does that mean that states begin and jurisdictions go back to where they feel like maybe they have more control and less requirements in terms of juvenile justice entry? Um, the architects of the Family First Act thought about that and have included provisions for that. Next. I'd like to turn it over at this point um, to Peter Watson, who's the Senior Director of the Technical Assistance Unit with KC Family Programs. In, in supporting the implementation of um, Family First, there's been a very strong collaboration between the NEA KC Foundation and KC Family Programs that certainly has enriched and built support um, for jurisdictions that are, that are implementing Family First. Peter? Thank you, Tim and Rob. Um, I am going to try to give you uh, a sense of what's happening out there in the states and jurisdictions around the country in terms of uh, engaging in implementation planning for family first, try to give you some of the trends and understanding of where states are, and also try to layer in my understanding of uh, where and how juvenile justice has been involved in that planning and how states are thinking about that um, as, they, as they work forward. Um, with each other. So um, you can go to the next slide. Um, the, uh, and I think Rob and uh, Tim set this up well, so I don't want to belabor it, but I, I, we always want to start at Casey Family Programs and thinking about the potential of Family First. And we've learned this from the early states, particularly, that uh, put together their plans to begin implementing in late 2019. And that is the, the need to really be clear, again, as Rob and uh, Tim talked about, about what your vision is for where you want to take your systems uh, in different states and jurisdictions. And the key thing here, I think, that we at Casey Family Programs talk about and the early jurisdictions have been talking about is you need to look at Family First as a tool towards whatever transformation you're moving towards, uh, as opposed to, I think, Rob said, a way to draw down um, additional federal funding. If you look at it as a compliance exercise, you're probably not going to be um, as successful as you might be if you look at Family First as one tool to, as we think of it, it's a way to operationalize hope around the country for um, children, young people, families. So um, next slide. What I wanted to try to do is just give you a couple of quick examples of how a few of the early states and jurisdictions have uh, laid out that vision. So in the next slide, you'll see Washington, D.C. was the first. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yep, there we go. Washington, D.C. was the first jurisdiction to submit a prevention plan. Um, and just at the bottom there in red, the plan was not to be driven by Family First, but rather to leverage new opportunities provided by Family First as part of a comprehensive approach to family and child well-being. And if you look at the District of Columbia's prevention plan that they submitted to the Children's Bureau, it lays out a much broader vision of prevention within the district. Uh, with mayor's office funding and Family First is a very critical piece of that, but it certainly is not the whole, um, uh, it's not uh, the main element for sure. There's other um, aspects of their prevention plan. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, I've got an example from Nebraska. I'll leave that for you to read. Uh, the one after that, Washington State, uh, next slide, is uh, Washington State recently uh, put several uh, of their agencies together, including juvenile justice and child welfare. And so again, in red, they talk about how Family First is going to help them move forward into, into an overall prevention focused portfolio. Um, and then the next slide uh, is not from the prevention plan, but when Utah, which is one of a few states that actually has their prevention plan approved, uh, this is the press release or part of it that they put out right after that plan was approved by the, by the Children's Bureau. And what I wanted to point out, the first paragraph there 
is from Diane Moore, who's Utah's Director of Child and Family Services, and her quote about uh, Family First. The second is um, uh, from Brett Peterson, who's the Director of Juvenile Justice Services in Utah, as a way of signaling that Utah uh, worked hand-in-hand uh, -hand between child welfare and juvenile justice in putting together their prevention plan for Family First. And so that's just a, a critical, uh, I think, signal that, uh, to what Rob and, and um, Tim have been saying, that we really need to look at this holistically in terms of uh, putting these plans together. So next slide. I want to just give you a quick summary of what's happening. At this point across the country, there are 11 jurisdictions, the District of Columbia and 10 states that have submitted the prevention plans to the Children's Bureau. Four of those uh, have now been approved, uh, the District of Columbia, Utah, Arkansas, and Maryland. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Currently, uh, here's how it's uh, breaking out. This is our understanding of it. This may change, but if you look at what the intention is anyway of states that would like to implement in 2019, 2020, and 2021, this is how the states break down. Uh, there's no uh, requirement here that states say exactly when they're gonna go and then they stick to it. Any of the states in 2020 could push to 2021, and states in 2021 could push and implement in 2020. So this is a little bit of a, of a change, but it just gives you a sense of the range and how states are split up um, across the country. So next slide. What we've done at Casey Family Programs is started a learning collaborative for all of the states uh, to help them uh, interact with each other as they are engaged in their implementation planning, putting together these prevention plans, trying to figure out how to implement the QRTP requirements that Rob talked about. And even beyond that, once they submit their prevention plans, what implementation looks like. Uh, I won't go into details about this, but just want to let you know what I'm going to be sharing with you about trends is coming mostly from my understanding from talking to all these states since last June. We've had bi-monthly uh, meetings. Uh, we focus in on particular topics. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see some of the topics. These are driven very much by the states and jurisdictions in terms of what they want to want to work uh, on what they want to discuss with each other, and we've just done our best to keep them connected so that people aren't isolated as they're doing these plans um, and figuring out how they want to implement Family First. Uh, so next slide. So I just want to give you a couple of, uh, this is labeled learning collaborative themes, but I'd probably broaden it a little bit. They, it comes from our learning collaborative on Family First, uh, but this is really themes from what the states are doing. So a couple things I've already talked about. Uh, the idea that a broader vision is necessary and Family First isn't an end in itself. Uh, the second uh, probably won't surprise anyone, but there's a significant amount of time, energy, and capacity within states that's needed in order to get this off the ground. And so states are looking at what they refer to sometimes as scaffolding from previous work, um, different uh, planning infrastructure they might have in place that they could build upon. So for example, states uh, out there that had 4E waivers have been able to use some of the either implementation teams or groups or evaluation capacity to inform and help them engage in their family first planning. Uh, nevertheless, there's a sizable investment uh, around staffing, attention, engagement with stakeholders that's critical to do this. What I think we've seen is that if there's not a, a point person uh, or more than one within a state who has either decision-making authority or strong links to those who do within the state, uh, the implementation planning tends to struggle, and you really need to lay out a structure for uh, how to engage with different stakeholders within the child welfare agency at a minimum, but uh, much more broadly in order to do this right. Um, the other thing is around the 4E waiver issue, um, it, it's, we're, we're transitioning around or from uh, the 4E waiver in a number of states to, to new funding streams, but it's not a it's not a certainly a one-to-one -one replacement, and so states are trying to figure that out as they go along. The third uh, point here is that everyone is learning while doing, and I think the important point I'd say here is that as states have put together these prevention plans, uh, what they've realized is that they don't need to have everything completely figured out. When you submit a prevention plan to the federal government and it's approved, you're just beginning. You can amend that plan going forward. You can add to the way you define candidacy. 
Um, so you need to figure out how you want to start and then realize you're going to build on that. Uh, Rob referenced, you know, taking 20 years to implement this. It's going to take a long time, and we can adjust while we go and as we learn from each other. Next slide. So um, I want to just talk a little bit more about this concept of candidacy. As Rob said, there is no um, – uh, how do I put it? The federal government, uh, the Children's Bureau, uh, was clear from early on that it was not going to define candidacy and was leaving it up to the states. And the legislation uh, just broadly talks about um, candidacy and needing to define uh, children who are at risk of entering into foster care um, or imminent risk of entering into at risk of entering into foster care. So if you look across the plans that have been put together. Uh, there's a range of the ways states have defined their particular uh, candidacy. And the important point here, I think, uh, that the states have shared with us is that this really has to be based on thinking about who the states want to serve, um, conducting some sort of a needs assessment so that they have a clear understanding of who these young people would be in different uh, buckets that you might define candidacy, where they're located in the states, what their needs would be for services of the type that Rob talked about, um, so that they can have a cl as clear a definition as possible of their target population um, and think about, well, then what services do we need to put in place in the state in order to meet those needs? Do we have those evidence-based programs in place already can, that we can build on? Do we have to bring in new evidence-based programs and how are we going to do that? So putting together a clear plan and understanding of who's going to be served and how to get the services in place to meet them is really a critical part of the Family First uh, implementation and prevention planning. Um, the other thing I would say here, I just referenced it, but when we got uh, a first group of states together that originally intended to implement in 2019, they were a, a number of them had decided that they would put a relatively basic definition of candidacy in their first prevention plan that they submitted to the federal government, but they fully intended to expand that over time, to widen out their definition of candidacy so that they would be able to serve more young people and more families. And several of the states in their prevention plan that they submitted to the federal government were absolutely explicit about that because they wanted to be clear in their written documentation that they did intend to amend that over time and widen or broaden out the, their definitions of candidacy. You can see that in the Utah plan, for instance, if you take a look at it. Um, I think that I've talked about the second one here, only I, I guess I should step back and say it is really critical to have a strong child welfare agency lead, but having an integrated planning structure that includes uh, folks from other agencies, other branches of government, constituents uh, being involved, um, uh, people with lived experience in different aspects of the system, all you've really got to think broadly, I think, within um, states about how to put this together, and we'll come back to this, but that's part of the opportunity for juvenile justice. We need to look at, uh, and people who are juvenile justice leads and advocates in their states need to look at what's the structure that's been set up so far. Do we have a role in that? And if not, how do we get involved in that? I think that's something we'll come back to towards the end of this, um, of this uh, webinar discussion. So uh, next slide, please. A uh, couple of last things. There is a lot of excitement and high expectation for Family First. A number of states have um, had things like regional forums where they go around the state and try to inform stakeholders and people about what Family First is and critically what it isn't. Family First is not primary prevention. We're not, it's not going to really uh, enable states to draw down dollars to prevent child abuse and maltreatment, um, but it, it's more tertiary. Um, prevention, preventing children from coming into placement. Uh, and we need to be clear about that with everyone so they understand uh, what, what we're doing here and what the opportunity is. And think back to the idea about having a clear vision that conversations can also say, well, here's what Family First can do, but here's our intention to uh, go to a more primary prevention and here's how we're going to do that over time in our state. Uh, there needs to be a strong research and evaluation plan and infrastructure to support the, pre the prevention plan, build an evidence base. Uh, you need to use uh, continuous quality improvement structures to inform the implementation of Family First. So again, uh, we, we're going to come up with hypotheses about who we're going to serve and what their needs are, but we've really got to watch that uh, carefully as we implement in different states and see, do we have the right services in place? Are we able to serve the, the children and young people and families who are coming in 
uh, to the to the prevention system under Family First, or do we need to make adjustments as we go forward? It, it's just something we're going to have to learn uh, as we move forward. And and states have been clear about saying that when they when they work with each other. Um, there there are fairly strong um, evaluation requirements, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But states have had to be very explicit in their prevention plans that they're submitting about how they're going to evaluate different programs. Um, the last thing is uh, we've turned to this recently as several states have gotten um, either formal approval of their prevention plans or about to. It's one thing to put together a prevention plan for the Children's Bureau, uh, but that's not really an implementation plan. It doesn't require the level of detail that states need to step out in order to actually implement these family first prevention services across the state. That requires a whole range of uh, planning, structure, project management that you don't necessarily have to have in place in order to get the prevention plan that you submit to the Children's Bureau done. And so um, states are beginning to share information with each other about how to do that. And in some cases, what that means is you might have some folks involved in a high-level planning group early on in a state to get the overall plan completed, but then you might need to shift to a different group of people who are going to engage in this more detailed implementation planning. And again, to me, from a, from a juvenile justice perspective, that might be that you bring different people into the discussion at that point to really talk about what it's going to look like to engage families with these types of services. And I also would say that one of the things that we've learned and we've seen is that in a number of states, uh, juvenile justice uh, has more experience with uh, certain evidence-based programs or even evidence-based programs in general than the child welfare system has. And so there's been that partnership in certain states around working with juvenile justice to take some of those, those programs, those evidence-based programs that have been rated by the federal government um, and then figure out the best way to use them for uh, a broader population in the state. So uh, next slide, please. Just a couple of implementation roadblocks. I, this probably isn't the webinar to really go over these, but as Rob uh, mentioned, there are the evidence-based programs have to be rated uh, by a, there's a federal prevention clearinghouse. It's been funded by the Children's Bureau uh, at APT Associates. There's been some frustration about the slow pace of the, 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 um, the reviews of evidence-based programs so far. So there's a relatively limited set of programs that have been rated. Uh, one of the things about the Family First Transition Act that Rob uh, referenced is it did allocate more funds for this clearinghouse, so I think there's some hope that that perhaps will lead to an expansion of their ability to review more programs remove the, or review them quickly. There has been also been a lack of clarity about when these reviews are going to occur, so it's a little hard to know, uh, you know when different programs are actually going to get reviewed, so as a state it's hard to know what to count on. States can do their own reviews if there are programs that aren't in the queue uh, in the clearinghouse, if they uh, undertake the same uh, types of reviews that the clearinghouse is doing, there's a handbook they can use, but there's a, a pretty big burden of time uh, around that. But there are some states who have moved forward. If a state rates a program in a certain way and that's approved and accepted by the Children's Bureau, any other state can use that program at the rated level, whether well-supported, supported, or promising until the clearinghouse weighs in at some point down the road. Um, the other thing, I, Rob mentioned this, but the Family First Transition Act actually delays for several years a requirement that states uh, spend 50% of their of the funds that they draw down have to be allocated towards well-supported evidence-based programs. That's the highest level. Uh, and I think there's been some worry that that's going to, again, limit state's ability to use programs that are rated as supported or promising, and therefore maybe limit the ability to bring those into a higher level of, of evidence. But that's been relaxed for a while, so it gives states more flexibility. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the last thing I'll say is that the Children's Bureau has, uh, I think, higher expectations for the evaluation and CQI aspects of the prevention plan than states were uh, originally expecting. It seems like that has, um, uh, caused some delays in getting these plans finalized. Uh, states are working their way through that now with the Children's Bureau, with each other, with um, uh, uh, organizations like Casey Family Programs to try to make sure everybody knows how to meet those requirements. So next slide. Thanks. Uh, so last thing I want to do um, just for a few minutes is let you know some uh, of the things that 
I've uh, tried to understand about where juvenile justice has been involved in some of these early states. And so, again, if you think about the candidacy definitions, for example, uh, the states that seem to have explicitly uh, focused on juvenile justice in some way in their candidacy definitions would be Utah, Washington State, Nebraska, and Maryland. And that doesn't mean the other states won't be serving um, young people involved with juvenile justice, but those four, Utah, Washington, Nebraska, and Maryland, explicitly called out juvenile justice in some way, um, or uh, young people involved with the juvenile justice system as candidates for Family First Prevention Services. Um, then the other thing is that uh, among the states that I have uh, listed here, um, the, uh, there are different ways that the states have engaged with juvenile justice uh, representatives or agencies uh, in their planning processes to get their prevention plans created. So in Virginia, uh, the Juvenile Justice Agency is one of five uh, high agencies um, that they um, have engaged in their three-branch approach to the development of their Family First Prevention Plan. And so juvenile justice has been at the table the whole time. Uh, Kansas has a whole section in its prevention plan where it talks about crossover youth services in Kansas and how they want to expand the prevention services that are available for youth who are involved in the, in the um, juvenile justice uh, system through Family First. I was at uh, the Ohio Family First leadership team meeting a few weeks ago, and uh, they have not submitted their plan yet. They're not uh, implementing Family First until 2021, but the Director of Juvenile Justice for the State of Ohio is sitting at the table. And again, that's a state where uh, they were talking about how much they can learn about evidence-based programs and the way that they have been implemented in Ohio through the juvenile justice, justice system and then figure out how to apply those uh, to their family first work. Um, there's a juvenile justice work group in Colorado that's part of the Colorado structure. So there's a specific work group called out to look at juvenile justice. I expect Colorado will be uh, submitting their prevention plan relatively soon. So everybody will be able to get a look at that. Um, and again, I, I used the Utah example earlier. Uh, clearly juvenile justice was at the table co-planning and, and figuring out the Utah approach to uh, the Utah prevention plan for Family First. So, there, I just wanted to raise a couple of those examples to let everybody know that there are definitely avenues uh, to be involved in the planning and there are examples of it and we can get people more information. These prevention plans are public documents for the most point, uh, for the most part, so uh, anyone on the call can look at these and have get more of an idea about what the potential is, whether you're from any of these states or another. So I think I'll stop there and turn it over to, I think, is it Rob or Tim next? Yeah. Tim. Thank you, Peter. This was a great exercise in, a, in really answering a question that we often ask ourselves as leaders and as systems and as collaborative planning groups about, you know, what else is out there? You know, who else is addressing these issues? What opportunities have been identified and how can we build on, on what's working in other places? And it's so helpful to know. And in the case of Family First, there's also this opportunity to know of programs and prevention inter interventions that have been approved that we might also be able to build upon without having to go through the full process ourselves, at least at this stage. So what a tremendous opportunity to come together really as a country and share um, lessons learned, challenges, opportunities, and build on what's working out there and truly have that continuum of care that I think as, as the District of Columbia identified in their plan that focuses on child and youth well-being. Let's go to the next slide. So, how would you get involved? I know that folks that are listening today are already, in many cases, involved in one way or another. Some may not be involved. I know there's cases where juvenile justice leaders and, and child welfare leaders haven't worked together or in some cases even met each other within the same jurisdiction. So I think we probably have a continuum in terms of the levels of engagement that exist already. And we certainly would encourage you to share your stories of your engagement and, and again, continue that process of of learning um, from each other. It seems like the first and most important step, if you don't already know or aren't already involved, is to inquire and be curious about the status of Family First implementation in the state. 
and get involved to the extent that you can, um, and I think it's in your interest to be very involved in the assessment of needs and capacity um, and the discussions in states about things like candidacy and about continuum of care and about how we respond across systems in terms of children, youth, and families that are either involved in our systems or at risk of being involved in our systems. Um, to me, you know, there's no sense in certainly if I wasn't involved, I wouldn't ponder the fact that I hadn't been involved up until now, but um, tremendous opportunity coming off a webinar to say, hey, I was just on a webinar about this and there were some opportunities identified. I learned about what some other states are doing, just wondering how that's going here, what's working well, what have we already got going, how can we get involved and, and add some value. Um, my belief from a juvenile justice perspective is that um, there's a value to juvenile justice system leaders and those involved with juvenile justice systems and being involved as early in the planning process as possible. And really for probably two primary reasons. One is to make sure we get the best vision and the best plan possible that's fully informed by all those who are impacted by it. Um, the second is that I believe um, the juvenile justice system adds value to this. There, when you, many of the prevention programs that have been approved already are programs and interventions that the juvenile justice system and the behavioral health systems are much more familiar with than perhaps the child welfare systems. Much of the work that um, juvenile justice systems have done around uh, reducing the size of their systems and supporting young people in their families and in their communities, there's profound lessons learned, profound value um, from that work that could inform the work moving forward. So I would think about it both as what can we draw from this, how can this help us move toward our vision, but also what we bring to the table in this collective vision that actually could occur across systems. Um, having worked on many collaborative efforts over the years, it was always very helpful to think about collaboration as not that we do everything together, but this process of our system does this, your system does that. When we, when we learn about each system, and in this case, you've learned a lot about Family First, which is something that primarily is um, landed at the feet of the child welfare systems, at least initially, um, you've now learned about something that they're working on, if you hadn't already, and there's more you could learn, obviously, about their system, but you learn about their system, they learn about yours, and then when you find common interest and common ground, those are the things you can collaborate around. So think of it as three lanes on the road. There's our lane, there's your lane, and there's what we come together in the center lane to do that usually is gonna to have to do with adding value for children, young people, families, and communities where we can only do really effective work or can do our very best work if we do it together. It doesn't mean you have to do everything together. Um, one of the things that I think is really crucial to this is that we really promote engagement of youth and families with juvenile justice system involvement. I mean, who knows better how these systems really operate on the ground and what has actually worked and what maybe has not worked as well than the actual youth and families that are involved. Um, child welfare systems have their own struggles and lessons to learn about youth and family involvement and tend to do better with youth involvement often than family engagement and decision-making. I think many juvenile justice systems have done some great work in involving youth and families. And if we haven't, we certainly need to, and this would be a great opportunity to get families involved who very much, and communities involved, who would have an interest in taking care of their young people. There's a common theme and a belief in this law that it's not best to depend on our systems to raise our children. It's best to rely on our families and extended families and our neighborhoods and communities and our, our institutions that are in closest proximity to families to ensure that every child can be safe and well and, and have a chance at a prosperous adulthood. And that's really a chance to do that, as this being one of the leverage points and one of the opportunities. Uh, there's also going to be, along with the research side of this in terms of the development of perhaps emerging or promising, you know, evidence-based programming, um, expanding programs that already exist, there's also a tremendous opportunity for data sharing across systems, even from the context of understanding which systems the children and youth are currently in or at risk of being involved in, and how we ensure that we're not, for instance, increasing juvenile justice populations through this. That's one opportunity. But there's also a tremendous opportunity to learn about the children that we're serving in our systems 
and and how we might at what points we might intervene to turn their trajectory in a more positive direction. Uh, one of the really key aspects of this work, and maybe one of the best opportunities, is the opportunity for a cross-system case planning process and intervention protocols. As you think about candidacy, one of the next discussions around candidacy is how will we actually engage with families. Every child and family or youth that's involved in the prevention services around first has to have a prevention plan. How are those prevention plans developed? Who's involved? When we think about strategies like um, you know, family group conferencing or team decision making or the other kind of teaming approaches or youth led permanency planning, many, many opportunities are out there that could actually really be part of our actual decision making process, our planning process and our engagement process around getting everyone on the same page about what we're actually working on and making sure that the natural supports and systems and family and communities are front and center in these prevention plans. All of those opportunities that we've shared, there's many that hopefully you have thought of. Often when we throw things out like this and think about maybe how we might approach it if we were in this situation, we're certainly not in your situation, but hopefully what we've offered are kind of stepping stones to ideas that maybe something we've said or talked about triggered another thought for you that even advances things a little bit further in terms of, of opportunities um, to truly not only align with the philosophy that's inherent in Family First and also inherent in many juvenile justice transformation efforts, but also that does lead to better outcomes for our young people, children, and families. At this point, I'll turn it back to Rob for any, any closing remarks or any kind of forwarding to action discussion that might need to occur. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> I just wanna say that if you've made it to the end, thank you for your dedication and taking the time and let me just strongly encourage you to send questions. Both Casey Foundations are prepared to support you. We want to understand what the questions are. And as I noted, we may not have all the answers. I can guarantee you we don't have all the answers. But understanding the questions that folks are raising will help us put together materials and lead discussions to get those answers. Have a good day, and thank you for joining us.